Just hope you applaud after I'm done. <laughs> the great, one of the great honors of my life to be introduced by Douglas Wilson, whose book, Herndon's Informants, is at my uh, left arm uh, every day that I write. I think it's one of the four or five greatest books on Lincoln. And I might add that Michael Burlingame's book is also right at my arm. But those two books together, you have to look up everything you write to make sure that you got it uh, straight. We started out today with a wonderful joke about Santa Claus. Uh, and you remember the fourth phase of Santa Claus uh, is when you looked like Santa Claus. I would surely look like Santa Claus if I only had a white beard, uh, but you'll have to take my word for it that I'm well old, I'm, 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 I'm well old enough to uh, look like uh, Santa Claus. And anybody who's well old enough to look like Santa Claus, who's had a long writing career as I have, suddenly uh, realizes that if, they, if there's any books that they're projecting uh, and have projected in the past that they want to write, they better get to it, uh, or uh, they won't look like Santa Claus anymore. <laughs> I've had that experience twice now in the last two years. Uh, back in 1965, believe it or not, I decided that I, I must write a book on the Virginia Secession Convention. Uh, my reason being that uh, I was reviewing a book of four volumes, uh, 3,000 pages of the complete secession debates in Virginia. And I thought they were marvelous debates, but I realized that nobody except me and maybe two or three others would ever read through them. Uh, so it seemed to me imperative to do, a, to do a condensed version of those debates so that all Americans could have the chance to experience one of the great debates of the secession period, and I would argue one of the great debates in American history. When you read a condensed version of those debates, you realize how breathlessly close things were in Virginia. What brilliant uh, campaigners, not just the secessionists, but the unionists were, and how often their arguments sound contemporary. Uh, at moments, it seems to me that I'm listening to Obama uh, debate Bush on military necessity versus civil liberties. Uh, and uh, I was just determined to do that book, but everything else got in the way uh, until, until now, uh, and just this week, uh, that book came out. And it just thrills me to have it out after um, 40 years, 44 years of uh, projecting it. Well, my other uh, book that I've uh, let go all this time had an even longer history. When I was in fifth grade, uh, <laughs> it was that long ago, when I was in fifth grade uh, in Chicago, Illinois, uh, the Abraham Lincoln Bookstore had a prize for the best books written by uh, grade school kids on American history. I wrote a piece on Abraham Lincoln, and it was submitted to the prize, submitted to the prize committee, and I won third prize uh, for my essay, uh, and I was invited to the Abraham Lincoln bookstore for the presentation. Uh, and presenting me with my prize was Benjamin Thomas, and my prize was uh, his biography of Lincoln. And ever after that, I decided I must write a book on Abraham Lincoln. And here it is a half century later, and I'm finally doing it. Uh, my book is going to be called Lincoln's Growth and Americas, and it's going to cover, I hope, uh, various aspects of Lincoln's uh, growth, including some of the material that Professor Bray uh, talked about so, so absolutely eloquently uh, earlier uh, today. I can't match his eloquence, but I do want to talk about some of that same material, include in it the question of how and why Lincoln's speeches got so much more better, so much uh, more sharp and crisp and gorgeous uh, as he uh, went along. 
I also want to have a section on military history, and I'm going to be using uh, much of the same uh, material that Mr. Simons is going to uh, be lecturing us, uh, about as soon as you get rid of me. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that material on military history really seems to me intriguing because it seems to me that Lincoln grew enormously as a military uh, commander from some mistakes I think he made in the secession crisis to a glorious culmination. But the heart of my book is going to be on slavery uh, and how Lincoln grew uh, to be a great statesman on the subject of uh, slavery. And I do think he grew. And I don't think he started out that way. Uh, and so it's necessary for me to talk about the whole, uh, the whole cycle of his growth on this subject. And I can best uh, get us into that uh, topic by talking about Lincoln's two 13th Amendments. Lincoln's two 13th Amendments. You all know about the last 13th Amendment uh, and Lincoln's heroism in uh, enforcing through Congress uh, and sending to the states a, a new constitutional amendment forever ending slavery with the federal government interfering inside uh, so, uh, southern states to abolish uh, slavery. To accomplish that 13th Amendment, Lincoln did something he almost never does, did. That is to say, lobbied individual members of Congress, twisted their arms in order to vote for that, for, for that uh, 13th Amendment. And that was the culminating event, I think, of his career. Uh, and, uh, and a brilliant culmination, a more brilliant culmination than any other president has ever uh, achieved uh, in our history. But you don't know about the 13th Amendment, I, I wager, or at least most of you don't know about it. And if you do know about it, you'll probably think I'm wrong in calling it Lincoln's 13th Amendment. Here's what happened. On the eve of Lincoln's presidency, just before he was inaugurated, in a very, very close vote, the Senate and the House passed a constitutional amendment and submitted to the states a proposed constitutional amendment and submitted to the states forever keeping the federal government from abolishing slavery, and that constitutional amendment was declared unamendable. You could not amend an amendment, uh, they said, uh, that forever uh, kept federal hands off, off uh, southern uh, slavery. The idea of an unamendable constitutional amendment is a little bit... Uh, controversial these days among constitutional scholars, but at the time it was considered absolutely legitimate because there are clauses in the Constitution that are unamendable. For example, you cannot amend the Constitution on the subject of each state having two senators unless all the states agree to it. You cannot amend the Constitution uh, declaring that uh, Congress shall have no authority to abolish the African slave trade until 1807. There were unamendable clauses of the beginning Constitution. And at Lincoln, Lincoln's time, I'm convinced that people thought an unamendable constitutional amendment was perfectly legitimate. Here is an unamendable constitutional amendment forever keeping federal hands off slavery. What could be more different than that second 13th Amendment uh, passed in 1865. <clears throat> Lincoln was inaugurated president, and in his inaugural address, he had this to say. I understand the proposed amendment to the Constitution, which amendment, however, I have not seen, has passed Congress to the effect that the federal government shall never interfere with the domestic institutions of the state, including that of persons held to service. To avoid misconstruction of what I have said, I depart from my purpose not to speak of particular amendments, but so far as to say that holding such a provision now to be implied constitutional law, I have no objection to it being made express and irrevocable. Express and irrevocable, says Lincoln. I have no objection to that. This uh, part of his inaugural address, by the way, was added at the very last minute. You do not find it in the drafts of the uh, inaugural address that he presented uh, to uh, Seward. Now, the story of this first 13th Amendment goes beyond the inaugural address, for I am absolutely convinced that Lincoln proposed that 
that language to Seward in December of 1860 to, present, to be presented to the Congress. And that's why I call it the unamendable constitutional amendment. This will be disputed by my various fellow Lincoln uh, colleagues who were convinced that that was Seward's idea alone uh, and that Lincoln had nothing to do with it. And they based their argument on a memo in the uh, works of Lincoln dated December 20th, a memo Lincoln sent to Seward, uh, which has nothing about that 13th Amendment uh, in it. I am convinced, however, that that, that memo uh, was misstated by the editors of, the, of Abraham Lincoln's works. If you look at the original, it, the, the, it is not dated. It's dated only in pencil. Uh, and um, it, it is dated by the editors of the, the uh, Lincoln uh, papers with their conviction that this was the memo that Lincoln sent Seward in December of 1860. I am convinced, on the contrary, that that memo, which has no language in it about the 13th Amendment, was the memo that Lincoln sent to Seward right before Seward's senatorial speech uh, in January of uh, 1861. I can't convince you of that today because it isn't the kind of material that's conducive to a lecture. And if I did, I'd talk, that's all we would talk about is well, who, which memo this uh, is. But I'm absolutely convinced that when all of you read the, the logic behind the position that this is a January memo, not a December memo, you will agree with me. I am, I'm very uh, unconvinced that you'll agree with me about anything else in my book. Uh, but, but I am convinced that you will, uh, you will agree with me that the memo that people have been comparing to link to, to Seward's uh, introduction of a 13th Amendment to uh, Congress is not the same one as was actually sent, and it's Lincoln's idea. I'm also convinced that Lincoln twists a couple of arms on the eve of his presidency to, uh, to, get, that, to get that 13th Amendment through. These are the only two times, so far as I know, that Lincoln twisted arms of congressmen to get uh, anything through. The first, the first 13th Amendment and the second 13th Amendment. And I'm convinced that the issue is going to be in the future, not whether Lincoln actually did uh, ask Seward to introduce this constitutional amendment, but what we make of it and how we explain it. And in particular, how can in the world can we explain why a great emancipator four years earlier wanted a constitutional amendment forever preserving uh, slavery, uh, for, uh, I should say for, for, forever preserving federal hands off slavery in uh, the states? I guess it's that question more than any other question uh, that really got me going on what seems to me this, this really fascinating uh, material. And I think it has to be explained in terms of Lincoln's growth. Uh, uh, and I think that if you look at the whole cycle of Lincoln's growth, it makes a lot of sense that he would want that constitutional amendment at that moment and another constitutional amendment uh, much, uh, much uh, later. And the essence of Lincoln's position, I think, is established very early on slavery in his resolutions that he and Dan Stone presented to the Illinois legislature in 1837. As most of you know, in those, in those first uh, resolutions, Lincoln says, slavery is wrong and federal abolition is wrong. They're both wrong. We don't want to have the federal government abolishing slavery, and we don't like slavery. And both of those positions are, uh, I think, uh, typical of Lincoln's position right straight through this, this, uh, this, 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 this cycle of, right straight through the cycle of growth. Now, how can he reconcile these two things? How can he say slavery is wrong, Slavery is, a, is a, a moral disaster. Slavery ought to be abolished if we're really a, a democratic government, and the federal government should keep its hands off slavery. I'm convinced the key to it is a couple of quotations that he gives, uh, one of them in Mr. Wilson's book, uh, on this subject. And Lincoln uh, says, to achieve universal liberty, one has, has not to press black liberty. To achieve universal liberty, we must not press 
black liberty as paradoxical as it might seem. Indeed, as paradoxical as it might uh, seem. Uh, but Lincoln's position is that if we press black slavery, we're going to lose white liberty, we're going to lose democracy in America, we're going to lose the republic. And then when, where will the black slaves uh, be? Uh, his, his position is we have to have priorities, we can't dare touch that subject of black slavery or the republic is going to go to smash. Uh, and so we have to keep our hands off slavery. We have to hate slavery and hate abolitionism uh, also, as paradoxical uh, as that may uh, seem. I think you get this sense of Lincoln's that the republic is precarious. And by the way, uh, one of the great new books that we're all expecting soon is by Lucas, uh, and his book is entitled The Fragile Republic, Lincoln and the Fragile Republic, and that is indeed what Lincoln sees. The, the American Republic as being very fragile, very capable of being broken up, very much in danger, and not at all yet established as an important republic for the world to emulate, uh, which is what we all want to uh, create. You see this particularly in his first great public address, the Lyceum Address, where he talks about how demagogues can easily break up the republic and how democracy may not work if demagogues get a hold of it. Uh, and he, has, he clearly has in mind demagogues on the subject of slavery who will, who will arouse the South to secede uh, and destroy American democracy. We cannot have that. Lincoln says, we cannot have mob rule. We cannot have demagogues. We have to have a peaceful uh, democratic process or that fragile republic is not going to uh, uh, survive. Uh, and in his uh, first many years in politics, Lincoln hews to that uh, rule uh, and he deliberately avoids the whole subject of slavery. And when he talks about it, he talks about it in terms which are almost impossible to reconcile with the great Lincoln that we know. He altogether sits out the gag rule controversy from 1835 to 1844, which is the important slavery controversy of those years. It has absolutely nothing to say about the uh, gag uh, rule. When the Texas controversy arouses, he says some of the strangest things, if you remember what Lincoln said later. He says, for example, that, that, that there is a right of revolution, uh, and the Mexicans had that right of revolution. If he'd said that about the South in 1861, think of what could have happened. His whole animus during the Civil War is that there is no right of uh, of a revolution. He says that it's perfectly all right for slavery to spread so long as, uh, so long as slavery uh, is not by that spreading uh, saved uh, in uh, another uh, state. I should say victimized uh, in another uh, state. It's perfectly all right for slavery to expand. It's perfectly, uh, uh, <clears throat> It's not, uh, it's not wrong for uh, Texas to come in to the uh, Union as a slave state. He only says all these things over and over again. In his famous spot address in Congress in the 1840s, he talks only about the spot at which the Mexican War starts. He does not talk about the fact that Texas is coming into the Union as a slave state, nor does he talk about the Wilmot Proviso. He avoids those two slavery subjects in order to talk about the spot where the Mexican War uh, starts. And in his one sort of slavery uh, episode uh, in this first uh, congressional term, his only congressional term, his only time in Congress before the Civil War, uh, Lincoln proposes abolition in Washington, D.C. But I dare say none of you have read that proposal. Because if you had, I think you would agree that Wendell Phillips, that this it was that this is the worst worded anti-slavery uh, uh, program uh, conceivable. Lincoln says that slavery will be abolished in uh, Washington, D.C., except that the, uh, that the constituents of Washington uh, can decide not to do it. 
except that the owners do not have to uh, abolish the slavery if they don't want to, uh, except that congressmen and any other federal official can bring slaves into the, uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, forever. As to how slavery is going to be abolished, he says that slaves now in Washington, D.C. cannot leave or they will be freed. Well, if they leave and go to the South, there's absolutely no way the Washington government uh, can uh, free them. This is an abolition law that uh, cannot be straightened out and made into a, uh, into a successful uh, law. I pound away at this, and then, of course, he retires uh, and, <clears throat> and, and doesn't come back into politics in any important way until 1854. I pound away at this to, 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 make, the, to make this point. Uh, if Abraham Lincoln had happened to die on his 45th birthday on uh, February 12th, uh, 1854, no one would call him the great emancipator. No one would think his position was particularly emancipatory. No one would think he's a particularly great man. When we're talking about the greatness of Abraham Lincoln, we're talking only about the last 20% of his uh, life when everything starts to change around. And it starts to change around, as all of you know, with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Uh, uh, and Lincoln uh, is horrified by the Kansas-Nebraska Act, uh, and he issues uh, his magnificent Peoria Address, which, uh, which, uh, which, is, a, which is an absolutely gorgeous um, uh, attack on uh, slavery. Uh, the first real public attack on slavery that Lincoln uh, has uh, issued. But I think what's important about the Peoria Address is what it doesn't do. It doesn't say that slavery shall be put on the road to ultimate extinction. It just says we have to roll back from the Kansas-Nebraska Act. We have to reinstitute the Missouri Compromise. We have to stop slave expansion. But there's nothing in there about how stopping, or even that, stopping slavery expansion will lead to the abolition of uh, slavery. Zero in it, and zero in it for the next three years of Lincoln's agitation. Nothing, although there, there, there's one address in, in, in Bloomington in 1856, which we lost, where Lincoln may have broken his silence about ultimate extinction. We don't know because we don't have the address. But that is the only possible exception to the fact that in the, despite the Kansas-Nebraska Act, until very late in 1857, Lincoln uh, does not propose the ultimate extinction of slavery and doesn't connect his desire to stop the expansion of slavery to the abolition of slavery. And then, of course, he does exactly that uh, in his famous House Divided speech right before his uh, fabulous encounter with Douglas in 1858. Uh, and I want to read a little of that House Divided speech to you because it's very interesting for the way Lincoln is evolving. Even though I know you, you know it by heart, let me read it to you again. If we could first know where we are and whether we are attending, we could then better judge what to do and how to do it. We are now so far into the fifth year since the Kansas-Nebraska Act, since the policy was in initiated with this avowed object and confident promise of putting an end to slavery agitation, and, <clears throat> which is exactly what Lincoln wants to have done, putting an end to slavery agitation, which victimizes the future of the republic. It's that agitation that he's terribly worried about. He wants to silence that agitation and thus save the fragile republic. I just love your phrase, the fragile republic, Lucas, and it's one of many reasons we're all looking forward to your book. In my opinion, this agitation will not cease until a, a crisis has been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe that government cannot exist permanently, half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to, to uh, fall, but I do expect it will cease to be one thing or the other. It will become one thing or the other. Either the opponents of slavery will stop the spread of it and place it 
where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is on the course of ultimate extinction. Let me read that line again. It's so interesting. Uh, and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is uh, on the course of ultimate extinction. Not that it is on the course of ultimate extinction, but that the public mind shall rest in the belief that it's on the phrase of ultimate extinction. This is the first time he's ever talked about ultimate extinction. He talks about it only in those uh, terms. Or the advocates will push it forward till it shall become lawful in all the states old as well as new, north as well as south, and then the kicker of the whole house divided uh, statement, in my opinion, have we no tendency to the later condition? Have we no tendency to slavery becoming an institution in the north? Have we no tendency to slavery becoming national? That in becomes the central focus of Lincoln's campaign oratory for the next two years. He does not ever again talk about ultimate extinction. He repeats this, all, he repeats this phrase uh, in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, but he never goes beyond it. Douglas asks him, how is stopping slavery expansion going to lead to ultimate extinction? How, Mr. Lincoln, is it going to work? Lincoln will not answer that question and absolutely refuses to say what he is going to do on that, <coughs> on that, on that pregnant uh, subject. Instead, he talks continually and in increasingly hysterical terms, hysterical is not fair, uh, increasingly passionate terms about the possibility that slavery is going to spread to the north uh, and that we've got to stop that spread of slavery to the north. When you read his speeches in 1859 and 1860, he does not talk about ultimate extinction. He does not talk about uh, abolishing slavery in the South. He talks only about uh, stopping the spread of slavery to the North, which he thinks that Douglas's election will, uh, <coughs> will result in. Just why Lincoln thinks that's a danger, the possibility that there will be a slavery uh, institution in the North is a fascinating subject, one that I don't have time to get into. Maybe you'll ask me about it in the question and answer period. But it's obviously got to be an important part of my book. Why that's Lincoln's fear. Not getting, achieving ultimate extinction, but stopping slavery from spreading to the North, a danger that I think he honestly thinks is there. Uh, and we're going to have an enslaved state of Illinois unless I am elected to the United States Senate. Now, though Lincoln does not answer how the expansion of slavery is going to, stopping the expansion of slavery is going to lead to ultimate extinction, the free soilers behind him, the more radical free soilers, do answer that question. And they do say, this is how it's going to work. If we stop the expansion of slavery, only free states are going to come into the Union. If only free states come into the Union, eventually the free states will have a three-fourths constitutional majority. And then we can pass a constitutional amendment uh, getting rid of uh, slavery. That's the official free soil position among the more radical wing of the Republican Party. And that is precisely what the Southerners are afraid of. One advantage of coming to the study of Lincoln after you've studied the South is you have some conception of what the South is worried about. And what the Southerners are worried about, what the secessionists are worried about, is that eventually the North will have a three-fourths constitutional majority, and eventually the North will abolish slavery. Lincoln never endorses that position, but in the perspective of that free soil agitation, you can now see, I think, the importance of that first 13th Amendment. Lincoln wants to reassure the South that <laughs> that will not happen under his administration, that there will be no constitutional amendment abolishing slavery. Indeed, there will never be a constitutional amendment abolishing uh, slavery. Uh, and you can understand why this would be Lincoln's first 13th Amendment. He does not want the Union broken up on, uh, on, on, by uh, slavery. He wants to have uh, the continued uh, Union. Uh, and then, once you've consolidated Union, maybe that consolidated Union can do something about abolishing slavery. Once again, his priorities 
To achieve universal liberty, one has to avoid pressing black liberty, as paradoxical as that might seem. In 1860, that did indeed seem paradoxical. Lincoln could not, uh, <clears throat> Lincoln, well, then there was secession, and then there was a civil war. Uh, and Lincoln faced a very different question at this point. That is to say, to save the American Republic, if it no longer does he have to avoid Southern secession, he now has to win the war. Uh, and and as, he, as he says over and over again, what he's going to do about black slavery has got to do with only one thing, and that is what uh, <clears throat> what, you did, what you need to do to win the Civil War. You all know that famous letter to Horace Greeley in 1863 in which Lincoln says, if I could win the Civil War by freeing one slave, I would do it. If I could win the Civil War by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. What I do about slavery has only to do with saving the Union. Just like before the Civil War, what he was willing to do about slavery had only to do with uh, saving the Union from the agitation, saving, saving excuse me, the fragile republic, again, from the, uh, from the uh, slavery issue. Now, this part of the story is much better known. You all know it how Lincoln very slowly decides that if he's going to win the Civil War, he's got to have a sable arm. If he's going to win the Civil War, he's got to have black troops. Uh, he's got to have black troops to replace all the white casualties. And as I see it, he's got to have black troops in order to fight a two-front war. And he's going to have to fight a two-front war because he's going to have to hold the uh, territory that he's won at the West at the same time that he wins the uh, territory he's going to hold in the East. And his conception gets to be that black soldiers can, quote, garrison the, uh, the uh, ter ter territory already won in the West and thus hold it while white soldiers move East. That's his first notion. <coughs> you find that in his, <coughs> in his, in his, in his uh, Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863, that uh, he'll, he'll take black troops because they're going to garrison positions behind the line. I should say in, in all of this that a lot of people think that all, the, whole, the whole reason why Lincoln is so cheery about blacks uh, and so uh, uh, willing to push white liberty, white union, and so on, is because he's a racist. I think that, that plays into it, but I don't think that's the essence of it at all. Uh, and I think Lincoln's racism is a very problematical thing. What is not problematical is his utter devotion to saving the Union as the bastion of human liberty, as America's contribution to the world. Uh, if he can do that before the war by not touching the slavery issue, he will. If he can do that by holding the issue before the war to uh, stopping the spread of slavery, he will. Uh, if he can win the Civil War without black troops, he will because his primary objective is to keep these two things separated uh, and to stop losing white liberty in the process <coughs> of gaining black liberty. His profound insight, where he really shows his growth, in my judgment, uh, is in 1863, 1864, 1865, as long as he lives, <coughs> when he realizes that to win the Civil War, he's got to have a sable arm. He's got to have black troops. He's got to abolish slavery. You cannot keep the subject of black liberty separate from the subject of white liberty or you're going to lose white liberty. The only way you're going to preserve white liberty is to get rid of black liberty, as paradoxical as it seems. Uh, and Lincoln at last realizes, understands that, uh, that uh, paradox. And I think he thereby... Uh, puts himself in line with, thereby, uh, thereby uh, makes himself part of what I consider the central theme in American history. The central theme in American history, in my judgment, is the growth of democracy and the inclusion of that growth in all kinds of Americans. In the beginning, white uh, democracy stands for white men's freedom. <laughs> And we gradually grow, grow as a republic so that it includes then black people's uh, liberty and women's liberty. 
and uh, Spanish people's liberty, and immigrants' liberty, and Indians' liberty. And the great theme of our history is the inclusion of these groups in that basic American formula that liberty is the American story and we want to achieve uh, liberty. In other words, I think the central theme of American history um, is in John Donne's poem, which, is, uh, which Lincoln did not know anything about, I, I wager, but seems to me to sum up exactly what Lincoln did when he realized that he could not separate white liberty from black liberty. I love this poem. No man is an island, says John Donne, entirely of itself. Each is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Each man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. Therefore, send not to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. When the bell tolls for black liberty, it tolls for white liberty, too. When the bell tolls for uh, saving the Union, it must save for, toll for black slavery, too. And what an enormous insight that is of Lincoln. How magnificent that he led the country to it. How magnificent that he grew uh, towards it. You know, ladies and gentlemen, when I tell people what I'm writing about and what I'm trying to do, I'm, I'm amazed by how often people say, oh, you're going to write an anti-Lincoln book, are you? <laughs> oh, you're going to talk about the first 13th Amendment, and you're going to talk about you know, the first law to abolish D.C., and you're going to talk about Texas Revolution, and you're going to talk about Lincoln's failings. Aren't all you're going to succeed in doing is demolishing one of the great heroes of American civilization? Seems to me, on the contrary, I'm doing just the opposite. It seems to me, on the contrary, that Lincoln is a man. Like all men, like you and I, he has his faults. And the real, the real test of a man, the real measure of a man, is how they get past their uh, problems. And for a great leader, how they get their culture past those problems. Lincoln finally, after all those years, got past his own sense that to preserve white liberty, you had to forget about black slavery. Got past it got to John Donne's insight that when the bell tolls for black slaves, it also tolls for white liberty. Thanks very much. <laughs>
you mentioned that uh, Lincoln feared that slavery was going to become national and that he felt that if he were elected senator that he could stop that. But in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he said that he feared that slavery would become national because of another Supreme Court decision. So how would his election as senator stop another Supreme Court decision making slavery national? Well, you guys are terrific. I knew it was going to be fun to talk to this group. <laughs> See, it's even more fun than I thought. Uh, Lincoln thinks that public opinion is all. Uh, he thinks if you can influence public opinion, you can, you, can, uh, you can control the historical process. He thinks if he can develop a groundswell of opinion in the North that slavery is wrong and must not expand, that, it's the, that the Supreme Court will not dare uh, abolish uh, slavery. And that's why he's at such pains to make this moral issue that slavery is wrong. And at such pains to insist that Stephen A. Douglas is a monster because he won't say that slavery is wrong. Uh, Douglas is, is teaching the North not to care, teaching the North to acquiesce in a new Dred Scott decision. So by running his campaign the way he does, I think Lincoln is trying to preclude a Supreme Court decision by making it so outrageous as far as northern moral sentiment goes that it won't happen. I, I think I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase the thrust of what you said, but would it be fair to say that uh, Lincoln in the mid to later 1850s had decided consciously, although he couldn't say this in public, which is part of the paradox, that civil war was not the worst thing that could happen to the country? You know, that, that's another terrific question. <laughs> and I wish I could get a couple of these other Lincoln experts up here to answer it. But uh, <laughs> I'm just not sure. I don't think Lincoln thought it was going to happen. I don't think Lincoln thought there was going to be a civil war. Well, I don't think Lincoln really understands the South. I don't think he understands how dangerous what he's saying is. Uh, and, and that's... Uh, I don't think he's faced your, your question yet. I think it takes the war itself to, for him to face that issue. But isn't he a greater and stronger man if he did? Excuse me? Isn't he a greater and stronger man if he knew he was running that risk? And, of course, the paradox, he couldn't say this to the public. But I, I do think, especially in light of the 1856 lost speech. Which we don't know. Well, <laughs> we have uh, verbal testimony. We don't have it written. Yeah, right. Verbal testimony, <laughs> you'll excuse me, Mr. Wilson, from 35 years later. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's when I start to wonder about Herndon's recollections, when we have no, justific no other justification of something that some, somebody says they, they uh, recollect. Well, uh, look, I told you that you're not going to agree with a lot of what I said. <laughs> I think you will agree that the first 13th Amendment was Lincoln's, but after that, it's all up in the air. And one of the reasons this subject is so much fun uh, is that there are lots of ways to look at it. The way I look at it is Lincoln does not take secession seriously, does not think it will happen, thinks he can get away with stopping the spread of slavery without a civil war, thinks if he stops the spread of slavery, he will stop the agitation, and if he stops the agitation, he will save the fragile uh, republic. Uh, and it's only with the war that he begins to really face how, how, wow, how drastic a choice he has made. Uh, Bill? A terrific lecture. I first heard you in February 1975. There's been no decline. <laughs> You're still enthralling. Um, don't you think you ought to tell the audience that when Lincoln didn't like twisting congressional arms the way he twisted John Brooks Henderson, the uh, slaveholding senator from Missouri, to introduce the 13th Amendment, the reason, why don't you tell, explain to them Whig ideology and, and uh, the emphasis on, on venerating the rule of law and also congressional supremacy? Well, Christopher, I want you to tell them. <laughs> you want me to? No, no, you, you do it, Bill. <laughs> Very quickly. I just don't know how to do that quickly. That's, that's a complicated one. Well, okay, I'll do it quickly. Good, the Whigs, good, good. The Whigs opposed Andrew Jackson and, and Thomas Jefferson to an extent, too. They hated the way Andrew Jackson bullied the Congress. And it, the Whig ideology, and David, David Donald first revealed this, and Daniel Walker Howe and Michael Holt have follow, followed up on it, was congressional supremacy that the president was there to shepherd legislation. He was not there to twist arms the way our current president is trying to do with this health care reform bill. Now, uh, that's, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm saying the Whig program. 
FDR, now hold on, hold on. I referred to him, but FDR and Ronald Reagan also twisted arms. But Bill Freeling will agree with me that the Whig program was congressional supremacy. That was the emphasis. But Lincoln has to do it, too, to put through the 13th Amendment. Better answer than I could have given to your question. <laughs> Uh, I hate to ask uh, here a third time, and I don't know if this is terrific, but during Lincoln's growth, did the Native Americans, uh, the Indian nations, uh, become more and more enamored, as I've heard? Is there documentation on that and that they might have, uh, that they participated significantly or not so in the rebel side? Yeah, that, that's a superb question. It illustrates something that I, did, that I have not made clear. There are limits to Lincoln's growth. There's only so far he goes. Uh, he certainly isn't crusading for women's suffrage, although he does on an aside say he was in favor of women's suffrage back in the 1830s. He does not do anything about the Indian problem. He wants blacks to vote, but he does not insist that Louisiana does, does that. He just suggests that Louisiana uh, lets blacks vote, and he suggests that they let only the most intelligent blacks vote and the ones that have served in the army. There are limits to how far Lincoln goes to John Dunn's formula. Um, and, and you pointed out, I think, uh, one of the limits, and one of the limits that we, I think I'd argue we still face, uh, uh, integrating the Indians into that John Dunn dream that I repeat, I consider uh, our central mission uh, and the central meaning of American history. You all have been a great audience. <laughs> I think you all get a 20 minute break. <laughs>